got Keith Watson here. He's the drummer of the Intemperate Sons. Thank you for being here. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, this weekend is a special day for you. Coming up Saturday, you're playing uh, Mavericks. And um, this is cool because um, one of your favorite bands who you've known for a long time, Chins Mojo, is reforming. And I was yeah. wondering about that. How far back do you guys go? God, I guess back, I mean, I've been in numerous bands in Dallas, but to the early, probably, yeah, the early 2010s. So I, uh, Tom, who is the singer and the, uh, the primary songwriter for that band, used to run a recording studio too. So I'd recorded some stuff with an old metal band there. And I've just known him forever. And um, we're all really good friends. And Pat, who plays guitar for him, we're, uh, we hang out with them every now and then. So it's going to be a good time. That's awesome, man. And um, speaking of those connections that you've maintained, I mean, you are with your brothers. You have, you know, Jake, Jake on guitars. You have Max on vocals, and they're actually my sons. Yeah, your sons. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's awesome, man. So, was that connection um, evident um, from the beginning? as far as like getting that sound together and um kind of solidifying that familial bond in a way yeah so it was pretty immediate it was interesting because we were trying to jam you know have a music studio up here but um they were over one day and we were jamming and so my son started playing one of his riffs and uh, we just started jamming together and we thought oh this is fun. And so we ended up going into the studio. All three of us had our own song and we recorded it. And from there on, it's, you know, we knew what we had. I mean, from the beginning, cause there, you know, I can play a lot of, not great. I play the drums good, but guitar, bass, you know, keys, I can play just enough to kind of uh, write a little bit of music they're so good at just taking what I've done and making it a little bit more of their own. And, you know, and, and now we're, we're well into the second album now and they're, you know, becoming pro prolific writers in their own right, where all I have to do is throw in some lyrics every now and then. So um, we just know, I guess, I mean, it, it's, it's been said a million times, but when you're family, there's kind of like this unsaid, communication that's happening between you that you just don't get when you're playing with people that aren't part of your family. So in terms of like vocal harmonies or just knowing where the other one's going to go before they have actually have to say it, that, that was immediately known when we started jamming together. That's really cool. So yeah, pardon my um, error in noticing that. So these guys are your sons. So mm -hmm. when it comes to your own musical influences, did you kind of bring them up on what you were listening to as a kid or did they <laughs> kind of go their own way and then kind of find your way back, meet you halfway? And right. then that happened in that way. Actually, what happened, I mean, when they were super young, we were, we were listening to a lot of, you know, alternative grunge, you know, that like Alice in Chains, Nirvana. Uh, we listen to Tool, we listen to Stone Temple Pilots. And I think along the way, they began to at least be huge fans of Alice in Chains and Stone Temple Pilots. Um, and so that, you know, obviously from that, especially from Alice in Chains, we kind of, the whole vocal harmony thing is something that we're all, you know, really into. And then as they got older, like my son, Max, who, who sings and plays uh, lead guitar, he's a little heavier like my I am with my taste. And then Jake, my oldest son, who plays lead guitar and um, and does backing vocals, he's kind of more of our uh, all indie kind of singer songwriter kind of fan, you know, from I mean, he likes Neil Young. He likes uh, a lot of the the, the singer songwriter kind of guitar folks from the sixties 
which is, you know, interesting. It's kind of like, a, he's always kind of been old school like that. So, um, so they developed their own kind of musical taste, but what it, what ended up happening is where, where I might be a little heavier, mm-hmm. edgier and Max, and Max is pretty eclectic too, but he does air on the heavier side. Jake comes in and, you know, melds his kind of, I'm not going to say it's not a softer style because he can, he's a super good guitar player and can play some heavy riffs. He's just, he brings a sensibility to it. That's kind of more palatable, you know, and we ended up, we end up melting that together and it becomes what it is. And that, and that is pretty eclectic. We're, we're pretty eclectic ourselves. We're not, we can't really be shoehorned into a very specific genre. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. yeah. You mentioned the influences of your band that immediately kind of strike, you know, in the foreground, you got like that stone temple pilots vibe and that yeah. Alice in Chains kind of stuff. So that was kind of a sound that you were gunning for, right? Yeah, it, it, I don't know that we were necessarily gunning for it. We were just kind of like super, right? it was, yeah, yeah, super influenced by it. I mean, for, going. I mean, I'm a little older, obviously, but going back for me, you know, Fleetwood Mac with the vocal harmonies, or you oh, know, um, that that's the kind of stuff that makes the hair on my arms, you know, raise up. So I, I've always liked that. It even before I ever knew who Alice in Chains was, but. Yeah, that's that's uh we like the guitar style. We like the vocal harmonies. We we obviously write in a a darker kind of headspace, you know, for lyrics. A little they're obscure, but they're also darker. They're not necessarily happy songs all the time, but uh <laughs> so I guess that kind of, you know, lends itself to some of their influence. So. Yeah, when it comes to the musical lineage, that's interesting because, you know, Fleetwood Mac, uh, when they became a four piece with the lineup that everyone knows, they became known for their close harmony. So it's yeah. kind of cool to draw that comparison. You have Fleet, <laughs> Fleetwood Mac's harmonies, and then right. coincidentally, you start getting, you know, involved with the harmonies of Alice in Chains. Right. With the latter band, that comes through especially. But, you know, what I surmise about your sound is it doesn't always have to draw from dirt. It doesn't always have to draw from facelift. It can draw from their more, their more, I don't know if you'd call it softer, but more kind of down home, kind of bluesy, kind of acoustic side, like in Jar of Flies, for instance. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm I'm heavily influenced by the Almond Brothers band. So, I mean, and Jake Jake actually likes that kind of southern rock sound too. So, some of his influence is there. So, it's even back further, you know, than that. It's it's that that's where the a little bit of the eclectic nature of it comes in because I mean, we're we we uh we have a lot of influences and they're kind of very um I guess retro in in a sense in in their tastes. So, for sure, man, we we like. I mean, you you look at Allison Chains when they came out with Sap, it was a complete departure mm-hmm. from anything they had done, you know, prior to that, and it kind of opened the door to be kind of more, uh, I guess, palatable to a, a broader audience. Well, we're not intentionally doing that. It's just that we we're we're all influenced by different things and like different things and we don't have egos to say oh the next song has to sound like this or it has to this is a cookie cutter sound that we're trying to go for we anything's on the table Mm -hmm. and it's cool because you have that right like-minded approach um of course you have a plan for how something is going to be utilized but as far as like the sound that you're building to you kind of leave leave the table open as far as what your sons can contribute alongside you right right exactly i don't want to i i don't want to be in a band where you know uh, some of its members or a member or whatever is trying to stifle creativity you know if 
I come from a, on the business background side, you know, there's no, send me an idea and at the, the, the worst that can happen, we'll use it. The best thing that will happen, it'll be made better by everybody else in the group. So, you know, I don't, I, this isn't the, the Keith Watson band or the Jake Watson band or the Max Watson band or the Mark Marks band. It's, you know, the intemperate son. So everybody's, everybody's got a voice. Yeah. So would you consider yourself an intemperate son too, to some degree? Yeah, that's where that I wrote a song about uh, literally I wrote I haven't we've never recorded it, but I did I wrote a song oh, and I this used was like that, back then, right? Yeah, yeah. I used that name. I was like, okay, that's that's interesting. You know, it's it's a. Uh, I mean, if you just came out and said, Well, we're we're the angry sons, well, <laughs> you know, that's that's yeah. not as cool as I guess intemperate using that word and it because yeah, because I guess intemperate is more nuanced, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It's not, it's yeah, not I mean, always it's, like full forced anger because exactly. there's a little bit of wiggle room for like you know anything else that would go. You can't, in there. You can't make assumptions of what what we're going to sound like based off of our name. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, and it really is a a cool name. It's a cool approach, and it's. Again, you have that family bond as one of your strengths. So you guys formed in 2019, mm -hmm. and back in 2022, that's when uh, The Color Within came out. Right. And again, I, I really like the the sort of the subtlety in that approach because, again, like your influences are very apparent, but it's not one influence over the other. Right. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, on that album, I mean, you can hear slide guitar, you can hear keyboards, you, you'll hear, um, you know, a lot of different, even some electronic stuff that we've done, which, you know, that's, that in itself is a testament to the, the creativity of everybody in the band. But it's also with, you know, one of our I'll call him the, the fifth intemperate son, but Amir Durak from Orgy, from Rough Cut. Now he's in Julian K. He was in Dead by Sunrise with Chester Bennington. He's our, he's, he, he mixes all of our music, but he's kind of a, a, he played on some of the tracks on the album, but he's been really instrumental in on the mixing side of things and even on the producing side of things to help us uh, make that sound better, right? I mean, you can, you can, you can get a good recording, but it's, if you don't mix it properly, then it's not going to sound as good. Right. Mm -hmm. And he takes a little bit of artistic uh, creativity with us because he's our, he's on our team uh, to do some of the, a little bit, do a little bit more than mixing, kind of produce a sound that is our sound, you know? So he's been super in, uh, influential for us. And I mean, he's, He's, he's one of my closest friends anyway, so I have even been dabbling in electronic music, reimagining some of our <laughs> some of our songs, just kind of because they're kind of more of an industrial band, Julian Kay is, or, yeah. you know, electro, and, and taking, you know, the creativity a little bit further down the road. But like I said, we don't, anything is game when you, when you bring an idea if we're if this song needs keys or something like that, then we're going to put it in there. We're not going to say, "Oh, well, that's not an intemperate son's instrument or sound that we're going to incorporate here." And if it's interesting, we'll put it in there. So, yeah, and you have branched out a lot, like you said, like the keyboards and stuff. Like it, uh, of course, like yeah, there's a bit of an. Alice in Chains influence right up the mm -hmm. bat. There's like a power pop sort of influence, sort of those leanings too. And I like how that all comes together. And then like, like you said, with the keyboards and stuff, and you don't just do like some cheesy, like eighties throwback, like, eh, 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 like yeah. very stark <laughs> and like, you right. like, again, you're very subtle with it. You you go for right. more of like an atmospheric kind of darkness to sort of enhance what you're already working with. Exactly. You can hear that in our latest single, really, the Lake of Poison. I mean, it's that was kind of our trippy, 
song that, you know, we said, okay, well, let's make it super trippy and something that's kind of out of left field in terms of what, what we've done, maybe a little bit more in the vein of, I don't know, Pink Floyd or something like that, but experimenting with keys on that and kind of making it a, almost like an a- ambient at- atmospheric song, but it's got a message to it, you know? Mm-hmm. It's a, they're all tools, so if, they, if they're used in the right way, they they can really add to a song. Yeah, so the guy you've been working with who mixes your material, um, mm-hmm. in what ways has he allowed himself to be that extra member of your band? Well, he he's... Uh, like I said, he's a really close friend of mine. So he, and he's produced, you know, a lot of different records. I mean, he's, yeah. he's, he does all of the, he, 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 along with his team does the, you know, Julian K stuff. He was instrumental in the orgy stuff. Yeah. And mm-hmm. even with rough cut way back in the eighties, you know, yeah, when he was in that. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he's also, you know, recorded, mixed and produced ban- or you know, other bands. Uh, he's done some stuff with Danzig. He's done some stuff with uh, System of the Down. I think he actually was instrumental in uh, engineering and uh, perhaps mixing their demo before they ever were actually even signed. So he's got a super good sensibility of what works, what doesn't work, what sounds right. And he knows how to build sounds and that type of thing. He doesn't, he doesn't overproduce things that we can't play live. You know what I mean? And cause we're a straight up live band. We don't, we don't do any of the backing type of stuff. So I, we're, but what he does do is he, he really uh, listens to the song and figures out maybe what it needs there, you know? And then he'll either, and they've done some Amir and actually Ryan Shuck, who is also the singer of Edema and, and Julian K. He was an orgy. I, with I mean, I haven't heard those names in like ever. I mean, you're throwing rough cut orgy. Yeah. Like Ryan, man. I mean, right. I was I was born in '91, but I I know those bands, and it's just yeah, it's just amazing to hear the range of the people he's worked with. I mean, depending on who somebody is, they might like scoff. Like he's worked with rough cut and orgy. That's like working with like um you know poison at one point and then video yeah. drum the next point. right right <laughs> yeah that's right man i mean and, and you know the influence comes through too it's like um i've i've been well you know the, what i was saying is they they actually produced or helped us produce game of keep away we went out and recorded out in california and they were in the recording studio with us and kind of working that song out and doing, we were doing pre-production during production, you know, kind of rearranging it and doing some things. So both of those guys are super important. I mean, people in my life, but they're very good mentors on, you know, song production on songwriting and that type arrangements, that type of stuff. So they've been extremely instrumental in our sound. I can say that. Yeah, and when it comes to like a, a really good reputation, um, representation rather of your sound, um, the top song that I saw on Spotify was Faceless Man. And I like, mm-hmm. again, I really like how it's utilized. Um, every single conventionally, especially these days, has to have like you know very strict like stipulations oh you gotta have a slamming chorus at 35 seconds flat. yeah and if you don't then you're not going to succeed but faceless man does away with all of that it kind of forces the more casual listeners to pay attention like this right. is not going to hit you immediately it's supposed to build on you and keep building it's like a right. natural growth like you know, when you meet somebody, you're not expected to be taken with them immediately and then always have like some other iteration of, you know, the solid positivity that you always experience with them. Some right. some aspects of them you have to really get accustomed to and, and grow with. And I think that's what that 
song does in the same way, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you know, the interesting thing about that song is that, that was uh, written entirely by Max and it's kind of from the viewpoint of his generation, you know, Max is 23 and he's, you know, it's, if you listen to that, maybe, I mean, at, at that age, you're, you're going to probably identify with what he's saying, but it was interesting to me that he brought, he brought it to, and it was, it's a swing song, you know, it's like a, a good old fashioned Texas swing song, but it's got a great chorus to it. And when we looked at the arrangement of it, we just thought, you know, there's, there's a lot being said here. And, you know, that's just one of those songs where you get to the chorus when you get to it, you know, and that whole departure in the bridge, you know, kind of switching and going, uh, switching time signatures. And that's, that is, um, that was actually meant to be a little bit of a hook, you know, to it as well, which it, it kind of is to me, but um, it's just, there is no, I guess going back, there is no formula in my opinion, if you, if the chorus is hooky, then get to it as soon as possible. If it's, if there's another part of the song that's a little bit more hooky, I mean, it doesn't always have to be the chorus. It can be a riff. It can be, you know, a pre-chorus that's got the hook in it, like way back when, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's no formula. It's, it's just whatever, whatever comes from the heart and whatever feels good. So in that regard, he, he brought the entire arrangement to us. We were like, this is easy. Let's do it. You know, we recorded that one really quickly too, though. That's another thing you mentioned, the swing beat. I didn't like, uh, think to talk about that, but like, that's also another aspect too. You don't, you don't hear those kind of beats anymore, especially when it comes to, you know, wanting to release something as a single because everyone's, still attached to that like conventional four four always slamming right. always do, 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 with no right. like no like groove or anything just very rigid vertical sounding but right again that that song faceless man really takes its time and uh and again like when it when it goes further like as the song progresses it doesn't get to this like really loud climax. It just kind of calms down. It kind of separates and it yeah. kind of, you know, ends in its own way. So that's, that really is kind of a, a game changer, I guess, especially being one of your top songs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that whole bridge is like, taking a, a chance to breathe a little bit and flying over, you know, the song and then coming back into it. But it's the, again, it comes, it comes from the influences and just whatever we feel like sounds good to us. Then that our hope is that, that it will to everybody else. And it seems like that song is doing super well. And, you know, the video's done really well for it is uh, too. So yeah, we're not, we're, we're setting out, in terms of our sound, it, I, I want, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I actually have a lot of vinyl. I know that's made a resurgence and I just love the, you know, when, when you hear a song, if you can hear the melody and then all the instruments are kind of in their lane so that you can, if I want to say, oh, okay, I, I'm just going to concentrate on listening to the bass or we're going to concentrate on listening to the guitar or whatever this drum beat is in the fill all of it can be heard and it's not, it could, but you know, it's not percussive. If you, if that makes sense, like I love Meshuggah. That's one of my favorite, you know, heavy bands, right. but it's it, what I love about them. And I'm a drummer. It's, it's percussive music. There's not a ton of melody in it, except for, you know, whenever they do a guitar solo and then they kind of sail above it, the rest of it sounds like a tank yeah, it's very just going guttural. down the road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to, I'm, you know, one of my, one of my son's friends summed it up for us, says that we are a kind of a 90 sounding band uh, that is obsessed with the seventies. And I think that is, 
uh, that if I could just sum it up, that's or you know for uh, a description of us, that's kind of we have a little bit of a '90s retro, but we're it's it's even more retro than that, right? So, yeah, I mean, and this is through working in what I'm about to say. This is a, a compliment to you, but you know, I can relate to your son who who brought the faceless man song to you, um, that feeling of alienation. I mean, you know, and I'm, I'm on the younger side too. Like I was born in 91 and back in 2005, like that's when I really started resenting like mainstream music as a whole. I like tapped out and I Mm -hmm. didn't, I didn't really get involved with appreciating like newer music until I became a music journalist and started doing this. Yeah. And uh, just knowing what's out there, including your music, it really makes me feel a sense of relief (laughs) that there's bands that, that still find merit in the influences that they're expressing. Yeah. I mean, if you don't, you know, I I love, I love bands that, I mean, I love all kinds of music. So, but you know, if I think that there's things that are important and melody is one of them, because for me as a lyricist, melody is what drives me to write words. Mm -hmm. So if I can't hear it in a song, then I, I, I may not, uh, I identify or relate to it on a, on a deeper level, you know, so that's, that's important to us. So it's important to be able to hear those, those hooks and it not just be this like bombastic, you know, percussive onslaught, which again, I love that kind of music too. So <laughs> it's just got to be in the mood for it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then when it comes to your, um, your other single that you have now, it's a uh, lake of poison. How did mm-hmm. that song come about? Well, it, the, uh, I wrote that song. I wrote the guitar riff, but I, I didn't, I wasn't necessarily into the whole song around it. And then I, it, it evolved, the, the music evolved over probably a year and a half, but in terms of the lyrics and then that was a collaboration with me and my son, Jake, uh, he made, he made the, the melody a lot bigger, but in terms of the lyrics, I, I have been, uh, stricken, I guess you would say with, uh, atrial fibrillation for the last year. And oh, I, 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 I got one day I was up here actually trying to record a demo and it hit me and my heart rate went up to like 140 or 150 or whatever. And I'm, I had to lay down because I thought I was going to pass out and I got pissed off. And I was like, is this, you know, what this it's, it's striking fear over me and I'm mad about it, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so I ended up, I wrote the words down like literally in 15 minutes and I was like, okay, that this is going to go really good with, uh, the music that I've been working on. So and that's not usually how I do it. It's usually the other way around where, um, well, I should, I shouldn't, I wouldn't say that sometimes it's together. That one, I usually write the lyrics once I have the music pretty quickly. It, it's usually not two years, you know, or year and a half or whatever, but that was just one of those moments of creativity and uh, unfortunately anger that, uh, drove me to that. So, yeah, it's literally about getting in your head and wonder, wondering about your own mortality and and trying not to succumb to the voices in your head. That, yeah, and and it, it it really sucks when like any kind of like health issue gets in the way, especially when you're in that zone and you want right. to just keep at it and keep going, and you're just like. What the hell is this thing? Why <laughs> right. now? What the? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly the way I was feeling. <laughs> but, you know, inadvertently, it gave you inspiration to keep that momentum going. And you got a song out of it. Right. 
So something, something positive happened, you know? Yeah. And, um, like, again, um, when it comes to the new songs that you have in the bag, um, for your next album, are you working, are you keeping that momentum up with all the same people that you've worked with on your previous album? Yeah. So that's the team, man. So we record with, with, a, uh, one exception, we record a game of keep away in California, but we, we record all of our stuff here in Dallas at uh, the kitchen with John painter. Um, and, and then everything is mixed by Amir. We, this is their label, the framework rec record label. So that's the label that was created by Ryan and, and Amir. And so we release all of our stuff through them and through the help of uh, the label group with Denny Sanders. But Amir still mixes all of our music. I wouldn't use anybody else. And then Mike Marsh out in the UK uh, does the mastering for all of our stuff. He, he mastered the vinyl record, you know, the Color Within vinyl record for us too. We remastered all of that specifically for vinyl. So um, it's if it's not broke, you know, don't try to fix it, right? And it really is cool that you uh, pulled down that vinyl because if that was in a shop, like someone would like pull that out and be like, what is, is this from the 90s? Is this from the <laughs> 90s band? Like an underground band that was on 120 minutes once <laughs> yeah. right. forgot to record. But yeah. it, really, it really does fill you with that excitement. Like if Hell I saw yeah. that... If I saw their record and and I'm a I'm a fan of vinyl too and I think your sound with the warmth that it has like deserves to be on vinyl. Yeah, yeah. It and we couldn't thank Mike Marsh enough for remastering it for vinyl because it's it's lit. I'm I'm not joking when I say from a sound perspective, it's one of the best sounding albums I have in my. Well, you can't see it, but I have 700 albums up here, you know, from yeah. all genres, the all off over the screen. Collection. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Behind the uh, video shoot backdrop here. Mm -hmm, but yeah. It sounds it sounds equally as good as any of the records that you're going to play on in your uh, on your system. So, yeah, and a testament to them. Do you feel like um, between your team, between your family, your bonds have gotten a lot stronger? with this new stuff you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, I've, I've said this before in, in other interviews, but it's, it's amazing to watch because they, both my sons had really not done anything like this until we formed as a band. So it's, it's, it's been really cool for me to watch them blossom kind of as songwriters too. They've both written music. Max is, is starting to write, more lyrics. Um, and you know, we're all just kind of, I think they would all say one of their favorite places to be is in the studio working on new stuff and recording, which is not always something that a band would say a lot of bands that I've been in, uh, you know, that, that experience was super tough and you ended, sometimes you broke up afterwards, you know, but yeah. with us, it's got, we've gotten, I, and, and, uh, you know, added bonus, I've gotten to know them on a different level too, you know, than father son scenario. It's like learning about them through their music, which is really cool. So, and, and you bring up a good point too. being a father to your sons. It's really not easy for, um, you know, parents and their children to want to, con to, like consciously connect on a deeper right. level, especially a level besides, you know, the typical father son bond. And, you know, usually how it is, is parents have their own thing and then their, and then their kids have their own thing, but you're good because you take that not only like, acknowledge you don't just acknowledge their musical interests or what interests they may have but you try to understand it on your own time you're right really, you're really curious about it 
And I think to an equal degree, your sons are curious about how you work and how you think of things. And I think it's a testament to this day and age because, you know, way back when, the generational disconnect was so much more apparent. So you have, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is 20 years, 30 years back, when it comes to finding out about your parents, all you had was curiosity. Right. But now you have another thing that you guys can connect on, which is that familiarity. Right. You come from that that same musical experience, that same musical background, and it's one that the guys can really get on board with. So that's something, man, that you have a, a strong bond. Yeah. yeah, you know, music is uh, another form of communication. So, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, almost anybody would hear is like, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to communicate with my parents that well, or, or this, that, or the other thing. And, <laughs> and that, that's just been a good, a cool byproduct of the whole scenario. It's just, you know, sometimes you don't want to outwardly talk to your dad or, or you don't, you, you don't, your dad doesn't want to necessarily outwardly talk to you, but you can, through music, through lyrics and that type of stuff, you can learn about the other person and it's okay. It's like, it's like another form of communication, but it's one that we all love, you know? So, and it's easier if that makes sense. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think nowadays, like people, I don't think people think that they're allowed to be curious about others. Like there's a certain point where they reach where they're like, okay, this is good enough for me to digest, but the rest all like, you know, leave right. down in the open. But yeah, but this, the way that you approach this music with your sons and based on the responses that other, other kids have um, given you, like they look up to you with that sort of same kind of, fatherly regard i think that's a another cool component too absolutely man i i i thankful every day that i've just uh, it's it's a cool relationship both you know it's just being family but also through the music it's i get to check in on them once or twice a week actually every day we have a band text you know talking about stuff every day but um but yeah it's 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 an amazing an amazing experience or it has been and it continues think, to be do you think just like going back and like putting this in perspective that this whole band that you've formed with with your sons was to some degree kind of like an icebreaker it was an icebreaker but it was also like icing on the cake because oh, you know, okay. the, the first thing was i want to now that I know that, you know, we can play together, that's great, but I want to, you know, let's record an album. Let's, let's just do a legacy thing. You know, this is cool. And then doing that and realizing that we all enjoyed it and we all wanted to, we all had the same goal in mind. Then that's just, be, that's just become what we do. You know, that's, that's the way we bond. That's the way we hang out. You know, we get, we hang out, after the show, you know, and watch the other bands and, and things. And we, you know, we, we, we have acoustic jams here all the time. If I'm cooking or something, we just throw down some music, but it's sharing. It's almost like, um, you know, I had friends that with, with their fathers, they like to go fishing or hunting or, you know, motorcycle riding or whatever. It's the same thing. You're just communicating on probably even different level with the music. So um, super, yeah, really, really very much an icebreaker, but it's like I said, it's icing on the cake too. So that's a really cool way to put it and putting this again with that same frame, putting mm -hmm. this all into perspective. Um, what have you learned about yourself? Not only as a musician, 
but as a person, as a father, as a parent? Yeah, I mean, I for actually probably the 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 biggest thing that I've learned is, you know, for for me, writing music and writing lyrics is kind of like therapy, and it's it's not being afraid to explain to them what a song means or, you know, just kind of like not being an enigma to them instead being, you know, somebody that that my life is kind of an open book to. Right. So it's kind of like, I I would have, I would have enjoyed sharing that type of uh, communication in my, in my own relationship with my father. He was just, he, he was super reserved, you know, for me, it's just like, this is what we love to do. It's, it's all art. And, and, you know, Max has been writing too, in uh, lyrics and I get to learn about him. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't sit back most times. And go, oh my God, should I be worried? You know, it's just about, Hey, I know you've got to vent and get some stuff out. And I'm, I'm kind of lear- learning your motivation and learning a little bit about what makes you tick. And, and I'm, I'm okay with that. So it's really cool how in in some way this is like this has been a start for you to really solidify the bond that you have with your family. Yeah, absolutely, man. And my wife has been super, super supportive, too. She's our biggest fan. And, you know, um, even going back when all of the instrumentation was being purchased over the number of years. It's like they weren't always interested in all the time in playing instruments until a little bit later. And then all of a sudden, you know, everything that was up here became a tool for them to express their creativity. And so it just kind of metamorphosized into a band, but um, I couldn't, it's, it's brought the entire family closer. I mean, literally has so lastly anything you'd like to say to your fans well yeah so go uh we're go listen to us we're we have a big rest of the year planned um you know hit us up on our facebook page instagram we're all we're we have a youtube page we we get a lot of you know views and things on on youtube but our let us know that our, you know, listen to our music and comment on it, you know, comment on it, on our Facebook page, let us know what it means to you. Uh, we write this stuff to, to kind of as our own kind of therapy and our own way to express our creativity. But our hope is that it's relatable. And, uh, so we, you know, totally like to hear from you as well. We're going to be releasing our, we kind of moved the date on the second album uh, because we've got a couple more to do. There's more fell into the hopper than uh, we thought. So it's probably going to be very early next year before we release the full album. And then I'm not kidding. Literally after that, we're going to start recording a third album because we have that much material. So just stay, stay uh, informed about our band and, you know, be looking out for a lot of singles and a a new album and even more stuff next year. 